Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone joining today's uh, live Q&A or Ask WHO about COVID-19. Uh, we will answer your question about the current situation and in particular about Omicron and what we know about its sublineage BA.2 that has been there out of high interest. Um, my name is Alexandra Kuzmanovic and I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Maria Van Kerkov as usual. Uh, but we also have a new guest for the first time. Um, he's not a new colleague, but it's new uh, in, in, in this conversation. Dr. Abdi Mahamud, who is our incident manager. Good afternoon, Abdi. Thank you for your time uh, to be with us today. And uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about your work and when we say incident manager, what does that mean in WHO? What is your job exactly? That's, that's a tall order. <laughs> thanks, Alex, and for having me and thanks for Maria for doing this for the last, almost the third year into this and for you facilitating. In terms of when we have an event in WHO, we have what we call incident management system where we bring all the expertise across the house and we create different pillars uh, from the epidemiology to the technical uh, network that Maria is leading in the infection prevention, clinical management, to the operation logistic and supply, all aspects are brought together under the incident management support. So we have 10 pillars plus one pillar, which is the research that oversees. So as the incident manager, I kind of making sure that everyone is coordinated by the technical and the overall uh, management and operational aspects. So we have the same at the regional level and then also at the country level, bringing all the expertise across within WHO. Thank you so much, Abdi. We are really pleased to have you here and uh, I um, sure our viewers are happy to meet you as well if they haven't seen you in other channels before. Um, as usual, I would invite you to send us your questions uh, using the hashtag AskWHO if you're watching us on Twitter. If you're watching us on other platforms, please leave your comments, questions in the comment section and I will pass them to Maria and Abdi. Um, before we start receiving some questions and uh, maybe Abdi, you can take this question. Uh, we normally start with the epidemiological update. Normally Maria does it, but as we have incident manager who oversees all the operations, so maybe you can do it today. Um, so what's the current situation um, with cases, with mortality rates, um, and uh, what, where are the hotspots at the moment? Thanks, Alex. Just to start, I hope one day we will see when epidemiology becomes boring again so that we see more life saved. In terms of where we are right now, in the last one week we have over 90 million cases reported and because of the change in test different countries have adapted so it's very hard to to make means where they, those cases are what more important is the number of deaths reported last week 68,000 and that has increased by 7 percent so while we are paying close attention to the trend I think what will be more important moving forward will be the number of hospitalization and case because it's becoming more difficult changing. In terms of if you divide in the WHO, the regions, the main cases we are seeing now, the deaths are in the US and I will spend some time there. So within the US where we see trends going down in most of the places, other part of America, particularly the Southern America has seen an increase. So there's variation. In terms when you move to Af Africa region, it's as common with, where Omicron has started, it's going down. Europe is kind of the western side, the wave has down, went down, but it's picking up in the eastern side of Europe. And it's really affecting where places with low vaccination and a weak health system. So Eastern Europe and Central Asia will be something. And then coming down to the East Mediterranean region, we see a big uptake in Gulf countries, countries that already had a, vaccination but also countries like Afghanistan and Somalia which is very low vaccine. Moving on to the southeast region, southeast Sierra, India and Thailand have seen the southern part but now slowly shifting to the East Asia, Thailand and so we're seeing a mixed picture and we pro country who have just celebrated the Lunar New Year I seen an uptake of cases. So Korea and all this have successfully managed now. In comparison, when you're reporting one million cases in other part of the world, even 10,000 cases is a big number for them. So it's a mixed number. Countries seeing an increasing trend, others steady, another doing. But unfortunately, in the third year of this, 
we have in more deaths reported. So just to, DG has touched upon Omicron since it was discovered, uh, how many declared. Uh, now just look at the number, thanks to the APT, 130 million cases since Omicron was declared as VOC, and 500,000 deaths. In the age of effective vaccine, half a million people dying is really something to, I think if there's a word beyond tragic, it's sad. And unfortunately, out of that 500,000, 100,000 in the US reported since Omicron. So while everyone was saying it is, will come to the Omicron is milder or milder, I think we missed the point that half a million people have died since this was detected. And the US in the last 24 hours, I was just looking at the number, 3,400, and someone smarter than me made a comparison saying that the seven, Boeing 737 MAX, two of them crashed in 2018, 19, 346 people died. So if you take the number just in the last 24 hours in US, that's 18 Boeing 77 crashing every day. So it's tragic, beyond tragic that you require in country that has free vaccine and richer. So we really need to vaccinate vaccinate people who have not been vaccinated and reached that, the 1.1 million people in Africa, but also the millions of people in, in the US who are still resisting vaccination. Thank you. It took me long, but I just wanted to put in a context. Thank you so much, Abdi. This was great. And uh, we, we, we haven't done this session in a couple of weeks, so we really needed more detailed updates. Uh, Maria, looking into this op epidemiological situation and, and tragic situation basically where we lost half a million people since Omicron emerged and became variant of concern. So uh, w w at which stage of this pandemic we are? We have safe and effective vaccines that prevent severe disease and deaths and we have other tools but we still and now we are seeing increase in number of deaths. So where are we going and what is your advice on what we need to do urgently? Well, I mean, I think as Abdi has pointed out, it's a very dynamic situation globally. Uh, and, and the numbers of cases, the sheer number of cases are astounding um, with Omicron. Um, the way that Omicron has replaced Delta around the world so quickly, the sharp peaks that we've seen, we, we literally have had to redraw the scale of the epidemic curve that we have been using. And it makes the previous peaks look almost flat. Um, we know that those are underestimates of the true number of cases. And one of the things that's important to point out is where we are in this, you know, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, we're getting closer to the end. I hope we're getting closer to the end of it every single day, but it's up to us on how quickly we get there. Many countries have not passed their peak of Omicron yet. So while some countries are seeing a decline in cases in Omicron, others have not yet reached that peak. So we will still continue to see large number of cases. The more concerning thing for me, and as Abdi has pointed out, is the, is the number of deaths that are increasing for the fifth week in a row. Half a million people that we know about have died. Um, the number of people who have probably died from COVID is much higher than that because we don't have adequate reporting systems around the world. But for the last five weeks, we've seen an increase in deaths. And the fact that we are seeing an increase in deaths when we have safe and effective vaccines when more than 10 billion doses of vaccines have been administered to date, when we have diagnostics that work, when we can get patients into the clinical care pathway and save people's lives, this is beyond tragic. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of emotions that I think all of us have on this, but it's about what we do with those emotions and how we actually turn that into action because we can save lives now. So where we are in this pandemic, um, you know, the virus is circulating at a very intense level. Um, we have the Omicron variant, which is the fifth variant of concern that WHO has classified as a variant of concern at the global level. But you have to remember that this virus still continues to evolve. There are four sublineages of Delta, uh, excuse me, of Omicron that we're tracking. So let me say that again. So there are four sublineages of Omicron that we are tracking. We have the BA.1, the BA.1.1, the BA.2, the BA.3. This is all Omicron, and it's all the Omicron variant of concern. But we are watching this virus evolve in real time. And so with good sequencing and good detection capacities around the world, we're tracking what are the proportion of these subvariants that are circulating. Now, we already know that Omicron um, has a growth advantage, is more transmissible compared to other variants of concern. It also has properties of immune escape. 
but we know some of the sublineages, BA.2, has a, a growth advantage even over BA.1, which means that as this virus continues to circulate, we will now see an increase in BA.2 um, with its increased growth advantage over BA.1. So for the person out there, everybody that's out there that's, that's watching this, um, what is important for you to know is that this virus continues to be dangerous. This virus transmits very efficiently between people, but there's a lot that you can do. At a global level and as an organization, what we're doing and working with, with governments, we're working with our partners to do two major things. One is to increase vaccination coverage among those who are most at risk in all countries, not just some countries, and making sure we reach that 70% target by June 2022. But we're also trying to do everything that we can to support the reduction in transmission. We will not be able to prevent all transmissions. That's not the goal. To prevent all infection and all transmission, that's not attainable at this point. But we need to drive transmission down. Because if we don't, we will not only see more cases, more hospitalizations, more deaths. We will see more uh, people suffering from post-COVID condition, long COVID. And we will see more opportunities for variants to emerge. So it's a very dangerous situation that we're in three years in. And I know everybody that's watching doesn't want to hear about this anymore and wants this to be over. We do too. We would give nothing for this pandemic to be over uh, and for us uh, to be able to move on and to, to get back to our normal lives. But we're still very much in this and we still need people to be careful. So where you live, still take measures to reduce your risk and your exposure to the virus. Wear a mask physical distance, wear a well-fitting mask, please, over your nose and mouth. Wearing a mask under your, your chin, uh, you know, off of your ear is useless. Um, wear a well-fitting mask, uh, the mess, best mask you can get a hold of over your nose and mouth with clean hands. Physical distance, improving ventilation, avoiding crowds. For now, you will, we will not be in this situation forever. That's my last point. We will not be in this situation forever, and the pandemic will end. But how quickly we get there is really up to us. Thank you so much, Maria. We have received a lot of questions on this BA2 sublineage, but I'm also seeing some comments that our sound is okay, uh, but not perfect for everyone. So please give us a minute or maybe even less. We will go on slide and our AV team behind the scenes is going to help us fix the sound and you can hear us even better. So stay with us, please. for staying with us. Um, Chris, Mark and Jill behind the scenes have fixed the problem and I really hope you hear us even better now. Um, Maria, a lot of questions on BA.2. How serious the variant is? What are the symptoms? And also, as Abdi explained and, and yourself, that we have a significant increase in deaths. Are these deaths linked to this uh, sublineage? So this sublineage of BA.2 is Omicron. Um, what we are able to do with good sequencing is to determine which uh, sublineage is circulating. We've, we've really, we're really in a, a, in a good position to track this virus globally. Uh, we're working with partners around the world to increase testing, increase surveillance, increase sequencing. That needs to continue to improve. Um, because we need better geographic sequencing around the world. So I thank all of our partners who are working so hard on this uh, to improve sequencing capacities around the world. Um, BA.2 is Omicron, so it's a variant of concern. It's already classified as a variant of concern. Um, our understanding of Omicron as a whole, and we have researchers around the world that are doing different types of testing, different types of studies, different types of um, experimental studies on BA.1 compared to BA.2, but for the general public out there, what is important is to talk about Omicron as a whole. Um, our understanding of Omicron um, is that people who are infected with Omicron can have a range of, of uh, symptoms. They can have no symptoms at all and be completely asymptomatic, or they can develop severe disease, and people are also dying from Omicron. On average, we know that there is less of, there's a lesser risk of needing hospitalization 
if you are infected with Omicron compared to Delta, but that does not mean that it's a mild disease. There's a lot of narrative that's out there that suggests that Omicron is a mild disease. That is not true. Um, it can be mild for some individuals, as can the other variants. Um, but we need to make sure that people you know, protect themselves about getting infected because everybody is at risk of developing severe disease. With Omicron, we know people with underlying conditions are at an increased risk of severe disease. People of older age, um, risk of severe disease increases with age and risk of severe disease increases if you're not vaccinated. One of the most important things uh, people can do to keep themselves safe is to get vaccinated. The vaccines are designed to prevent severe disease and death, and they are incredibly effective, even against Omicron. We are seeing a slight uh, re reduction in efficacy, but they still protect people from developing severe disease and dying, and that's important. So when it is your turn, please get vaccinated. This is one of the most important things that you can do and this is why WHO and partners are working so hard to make sure that there's access to vaccines for people around the world, not just in some countries. But in terms of what we understand of BA.2 compared to BA.1, um, BA.2 uh, has is more transmissible than BA.1, so we expect to see BA.2 increasing in, in detection around the world. Um, there isn't any indication to suggest that there's a difference in severity of BA.2 compared to BA.1, but it's still very early days. The studies are, are really just underway. Um, and again, we're working with so many people around the world and learning this information in real time. So for the person out there watching this, please do what you can to get vaccinated when it's your turn, receive your full course, um, and also take measures to reduce your exposure where and when you can. Thank you so much, Maria. Abdi, maybe, maybe I can pass this question to you coming from Veronica Douglas. Um, watching us on Facebook, can someone be infected with more than one variant of COVID-19 at the same time? Thanks, Veronica. That's an excellent question. And maybe a billion dollar question <laughs> that we are all trying to answer. But if we go back to what we have learned so far, dealing with all the other variant, so we have two ways of protecting ourselves, and that's the vaccine and getting vaccinated. With other coronavirus and another variant is Unfortunately, it, it wins or escapes with time. So the body, when you get infection, you have your immediate defense, that's so-called natural uh, innate immunity, and then you develop what we call the B cells and the T cells. The B cells produce immunoglobulin. You maintain those immunoglobulin for certain times, and then they go down after three to six months, depending, this is just an average, and this is the, the trouble, the flaws of the average. So please take, What's true for, for the average not, may not be true for that individual, Veronica. So mostly between six to 12 months, that's availability. So with, when those immunity go down and you will get exposed, and that's why we've been saying continue protecting because your, immune, your immunoglobulin have gone down, your first lane defense have gone down, you get, can get reinfected. But when you're reinfected because you already knew the virus or the variant, the body will kick in your second layer, your memory B cells, your T cells, and you will not get severe disease. While you may get infection, a mild infection, these vaccines will protect you from getting hospitalized and from getting to ICU and sadly to death. So whether right now the main question, everyone, if I got B1, can I get B2? We don't know, we haven't had time. And for WHO, we use 90 days between the two infections. So we are still just starting the period. Uh, so if the question is related, if you got Omicron B1, can you get B2? We don't know yet. But if the two cousins, that's what I wanted to say, that Omicron B1, B2, these are all cousins, they share common ancestor some time back. Uh, hopefully the body, and that's hope, it's not a strategy. But what we have learned in all this Delta, Omicron that the vaccine will protect you from getting hospitalized and from death. Can, I, so, can oh, I add something please. to that? Because I think this is important, what Abdi was describing. You know, when we look at reinfection, we look at this 90-day period, and, and there's not really enough time. Since Omicron was first reported at the end of November, we're still in the early days of Omicron, even though we've seen this huge spike. One of the things we're tracking on the epidemic curves, 
And of course, this is based on surveillance. We're looking at how the curves go up and how the curves go down. And one of the things we have our eye out on is on the decline. So countries are in very, very different situations based on you know, how they've handled this virus since the beginning and their population level immunity, their capacity to respond, the tools that they have. So the decline in the latest peak will be different based on different countries. Some countries saw a very sharp increase and a very sharp decrease. Now that we see BA2, BA.2 increasing in prevalence in, in terms of how much is circulating, we may, start, we have to see what that decline looks like. If the epidemic curves go down sharply, if they continue to go down and the trends that they're going down, then we won't see this signal of reinfection. Um, given that we don't have the 90 days to be able to detect with sequencing. So what we're looking for is the decline starting to slow. Is it a sharp decline or is it more of a slow decline? And that's based on a number of different factors. Come, as Mike always says, coming down the mountain is, is quite bumpy and it and it's, takes a long time to get down. You've actually heard us say that over several peaks ago. But with BA.2, we're trying to keep an eye out very closely to detect any signals that we may start to see an increase again. We don't see that yet. So the answer, as Abdi said, is we don't know yet. And I think it's really important um, for us as we speak. We speak, you know, telling you what we know, telling you what we don't know, and telling you what we're doing to find out. Um, I've been a little bit concerned, if I could just take a moment to say, I've been a little bit concerned about some of the public comments that we are seeing out there with people speaking with such certainty. There's still a huge amount of uncertainty. We know a lot about this virus, but we don't know everything. And quite frankly, the variants are the wild card. So we are tracking this virus in real time as it mutates, as it changes. And we have an excellent group of people around the world who are working with us to do that. But this virus has a lot of room to move. And Omicron is the latest variant of concern. It will not be the last variant of concern that WHO will speak about. Um, the next one, you know, that will come, hopefully, it will take some time to get there. But with the level of intensity of spread, the possibility that we will have other variants is really high. So we need to ensure that we, again, not only increase vaccination coverage, but we also take measures to reduce the spread. Thank you so much to both of you. You also answered Diane Tenney Adams' question about reinfection between Omicron and BA2. So we got two questions answered at the same time. Um, some people are asking about um, if we know the, um, the scale of infections in people who had three doses and those countries that have introduced heavily booster doses, do we see any different epidemiological trends in, in those countries? So uh, maybe I could start. So we, we do see a very significant difference in individuals who are vaccinated with one dose, two dose, and some people have had three doses as the primary course of their series. Um, a significant reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. Um, this is from Omicron, uh, from other variants of concern, and I think that's one of the biggest factors that is really, really critical that people hear out there. When it is your turn, get vaccinated um, and fight as much as you can for vaccine equity around the world for others so that they receive their first and second doses. There are some differences in terms of the vaccines that are out there. There are several uh, WHO emergency use listing that we have approved, and there are more that are that are being evaluated. Um, but whatever vaccine, you know, if you are offered, you know, please get vaccinated when it is your turn. If you're offered a booster, you've also heard us say, you know, take that booster. Um, but again, fight for what you can to ensure that vaccines are reaching you know, people around the world. We evaluate um, vaccine effectiveness um, several different ways, and we are working with several different groups, um, our technical advisory groups uh, who are assessing this information in real time um, with the manufacturers as data comes out on those many from the manufacturers as well. And we try to summarize this each week on our website. So we have these very detailed tables that go out and actually describe each study and say, this is the study that was done. This is how many people that were followed. This is what they were measuring. And this is what we see in terms of efficacy. But bottom line, you know, people who have been vaccinated um, are significantly less likely. Um, I mean, I think I saw 
I don't know the actual uh, numbers, 20 to 97 times more likely not to be, need hospitalization or die if they're vaccinated compared to those who don't. So there's a real importance that we still make sure that everybody receives their, their vaccines. Yeah, um, please just, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add on that because sometimes we mix between the individual protection and the population protection. So if you look at individual level that we have to have the, your account, your saving account needs to go up and that's by protection. So how do you invest in that? So getting the first dose, the second dose and some other people's third dose. Every time the body sees these foreign bodices, Huh, this is serious. Let me think of it. It puts an investment to produce antibodies, but after some say, I have thousands of other diseases that I need to worry, it goes down. And then you get, again, a second dose. You say, wow, these are serious. Let me take it serious again. And then when you expose again to the third time, it's like, wow, this is dangerous because I need to invest more, maintain high level quality antibodies, T cells, B cells, because this is I'm exposed to that. So at individual level, we talk about that. And then at population level, and that's what a lot of the discussion we so hard to explain, talking about the epidemiology, about the severity, it really depends how much population. So sometimes comparing one country to another country, it becomes a bit the whole purpose. When you have a young population who had three waves that was not mitigated, and high level of vaccination like South Africa, We've been saying South Africa is very, may have a high population level. Because of the South Africa, someone else start complaining. And another country has a elderly population, not vaccinated well, and they haven't exposed uh, the natural illness. So it's a complex interplay of your individual, the type of vaccine you get, the booster, and the environment when you live, and other measures you do to so in, in short, it's very hard to make a comparison between one country to another because it's very unique for that country and for its population. But at individual level, absolutely, as Maria said, you need to get vaccinated. If you're in a country that you are lucky, unlike the three billion of the world, we don't have the luxury of getting even the first dose. If you're in those countries where the vaccine, please get as per the recommended things to protect yourself. Can I, can I, I just wanna, it's not related to the actual question, but it relates to what something Abdi said here. Um, you know, countries are in very different situations in terms of what they are able to do right now. And they're looking to each other to say, should I follow this model? You know, should I follow what UK is doing or the US is doing or Denmark is doing or South Africa is doing? And what we are asking countries to do is to really assess where they are. You know, where are they in this pandemic in terms of the amount of infection that has circulated, population level immunity, vaccination coverage, and in particular, vaccination coverage among those who are most at risk, not just the proportion of the population, but is it really the right section of the population that is vulnerable? Um, and what is the plan? You know, what are their access to tools? What are their, what is the relationship that they have with their people in terms of trust? in terms of the society's uh, ability to follow um, and to be enabled to follow the recommendations that are being outlined. There is no one size, one solution fits all out of this pandemic, but we do know what works. You know, we know the elements and the tools of what works. The implementation is what will vary. And I think that's what we're trying to think through into this year. We're not looking at revamping the strategy for COVID-19. What we're looking for is adjusting it. And how do we take into consideration what needs to be done, what can be done given the massive economic livelihood toll and human toll that this pandemic has taken? And the fact that everybody is ready to be done with it. Unfortunately, this virus is not done with us. So we have to really remain vigilant. That doesn't mean lockdown. It doesn't mean shutting down societies. What it means is applying the tools that countries have at their disposal to save people's lives now. 68,000 people, at least 68,000 people died last week from COVID-19 that we know about. They don't have the opportunity to move on, nor do the 5.7 million people who have died so far. Let's turn the tide Let's change the trajectory of this with, with the tools that we have. Now, we may not be able to prevent all infections, but we can prevent people dying right now. 
So this is what we are asking, what the Director General has been asking for is a recommitment to this while we balance the response, increase vaccination coverage, get people into the clinical care pathway, protect our health workers, while at the same time reducing the opportunity for this virus to thrive. Not, just, not even to spread, but to thrive. We are still allowing this virus to circulate, in some situations, unchecked. And that's dangerous. We shouldn't be doing that three years into this pandemic. Now is not the time to raise the white flag. Now is the time to use these tools more effectively and for governments to support people in being able to keep them and their loved ones safe. Yeah, we have a question from Sarah Downs. Uh, do we expect masks to still work against this transmissible virus? Short answer, yes, we do. Um, but masks need to be worn properly. Um, we have advised on the use of masks, a three-layer mask with the right types of materials that has the right filtration, the right breathability. Just a piece of fabric um, is one barrier, but if you have a three-layered piece of fabric with the right filtration, with the right breathability that's fit properly over your nose and mouth, that offers more protection. We know that respirators offer more protection, which is why health workers are wearing respirators when they're caring for suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19. Um, and they still do work against Omicron. Omicron is incredibly effective at transmitting between people, but these tools work. So this is also why we are recommending um, for, to, to continue um, to wear masks, particularly uh, when you're in close proximity with other people, but especially when you're indoors. Um, and even if you're vaccinated, because vaccines are incredibly protective against preventing severe disease and death, but they don't prevent all infections and they don't prevent all transmission. Even though they are effective at doing that, that they're not 100% effective in that, in that case. So please continue to wear your mask um, and make sure you have clean hands when you put it on and you take it off. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, Adi, maybe this one you can take. Ella O'Neill Belch is asking, what are the best precautions to take if you can't have a vaccine? If you can't? If you can't have a vaccine. Well, that's a tough one. I think the, the best, there are multiple. In the first two years, we didn't have vaccine and we were able to beat this virus. So what the measures at the individual level at, at the community level, those the family, a lot of things that you can do and the loved ones can do that. We have a, a good proportion of, of the, not, not a good proportion, but a certain proportion of the, of the population that we, for the underlying reason, where it's congenital, that may not be able or allergic. So what I would recommend first, discuss with your physician, because your local physician will really know your profile and what kind of medication they can put. The good news right now, we have good, good medication that came out from the monoclonal antibody to the oral antiviruses to a lot of things that we can offer you. And the vaccine platform is changing. So my, our advice is continue protecting yourself. As Maria says, mask do mask. Uh, avoiding those risky settings where we say crowded places, reducing that risk. And then discussing with your local clinician out of the monoclonal antibody, the new therapeutic, which one? And uh, I think even among the severe immunocompromised patients have been given vaccines unless you are allergic to it. So vaccine will be the best shot for it. But it's a unique situation and, and I recommend to discuss with your local physician how are the measures. But the preventive measures we applied for the last two years before we, the first two years before, uh, the one, one and a half years, sorry to say, before we had a widespread use of vaccine, worked and saved life. So continue doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Abdi. We have a next question from Ria Deshpande asking about effects, and she's not the only one actually, um, about effects of Omicron on other body organs and long COVID after Omicron, if you have any new findings from research. So there's a lot of work underway uh, of better understanding Omicron and um, the disease that it caused. We, we haven't seen a change in disease profile in terms of the type of signs and symptoms. Um, and as I said, you know, on average, the risk of hospitalization is less um, compared to Delta, but we still see the full spectrum of disease. Um, and so there are many clinical studies that are underway, and we encourage countries to continue to use the clinical platform that we have established, which collects standardized data so that we can actually look at this in a, in a real robust way. There's a lot of questions that we receive every day on long COVID, post-COVID condition. Um, again, Omicron has only really been circulating for a short amount of time. 
Um, it takes some time for people to be infected, to go through the full disease. And then what we're looking at when we look at post-COVID condition, that's usually around 90 days after symptoms resolve, where people are seeing uh, a lot longer term effects. There's, there really isn't any indication to suggest that we would see a difference in the percentage of people that may suffer from long COVID, but we don't have a full understanding of long COVID yet. There are people that are around the world that are looking at how SARS-CoV-2, this virus, uh, and all of the different variants affect the body and the different organs of the body. We are learning that people who are suffering from post-COVID condition, it affects all organs of the body, different organs of the body, not all organs at the same time, and range um, you know, in severity. You know, from people not able to catch their breath, not able to exercise anymore. We've seen some studies come out, look at cardiac uh, effects um, a year out. Um, but this data is coming online and we need to make sure that we have good cohorts of studies, these studies of individuals who are suffering from post-COVID condition or may be suffering from post-COVID condition around the world, not just in high income countries, but in, in, in countries all over, all over. Um, but we don't have a full picture of this yet. I do think that people are starting to pay attention more to post-COVID condition. Um, this is something that, uh, that we as WHO have been working on, you know, for since the first six months of the pandemic. Um, and we're very grateful for the groups that reached out to us who said, look, we need people to recognize that this is real. We need good research on this. We need good um, care for clinical care of dealing with, with the short term and the long term effects. And we need to make sure that there's good rehab. So this is something WHO is committed to uh, with our clinical management pillar under uh, Dr. Janet Diaz. We've had a lot of seminars. We've had research that is established, but it's a work in progress. We do not have the full picture of this yet. Um, and this is another reason why we want people and governments and everyone to focus on prevention of getting infected in the first place, because uh, that is better, you know, in terms of any effect, short term and long term. But we don't have the full picture of this yet. We don't know everything yet on post COVID condition. Thank you so much, Maria. Abdi, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add that because most of the time when people talk about COVID, you think it's this upper respiratory or respiratory disease. Unfortunately, COVID is a systemic disease. Mm. And that's, that nuances, a clinician can understand someone taking. For the public, it looks like because you just presented with a sneezing or a cough, it affected there. Unfortunately, it affects almost every part has been documented, the complication, where it is the virus itself or our, our immune system start misfiring. We really don't know there's a lot with research going on. And then the progression of those complications, Maria just alluded to this excellent paper that was published in Nature. Literally, it was affecting every part of the cardiovascular system mm. one year down the later. So the, the risk and the complication from COVID when we see it as not as a respiratory pathogen, of course, that's the way of entry, but it's affecting every part of your body that way because of the vessels. It can cause vasculitis, autoimmune, the virus is so complicated mm. that that's why we say the only way you can do it get vaccinated and continue preventing yourself, preventing yourself with those public health measures. So we, what we have to look at, I'm sorry, I, so what we have to look at is, you know, people who are infected and have, have COVID-19 now, people who are suffering from longer term effects that we are just learning about. But those long term effects could be, could be a few weeks, they could be a few months, they could be a few years. We don't know what that is yet. And so as an organization, as WHO, with governments, we need to plan for the longer term. So it's not just now. And again, as I mentioned, we're thinking into 2022 and how we end the emergency of this pandemic, but we have to plan and we are planning for the longer term and how we, how we deal with the effects of this. And we have to think not just COVID, but mental health effects and the effects for people who have not received other vaccines for vaccine preventable diseases, people who didn't get the care that they need for cancer, for other treatments. So this is obviously quite a complex situation that the world is in, that countries are in. Um, but this is all the more reason why we need to end this emergency of COVID-19. And we have to end it as quickly as possible. It's in our hands. And we need everyone out there. Some people may think, you know, what can I do? What, what, what can I do to help? You can get vaccinated if you have access to the vaccine. You can also prevent, take measures to prevent you from getting infected because it's not just even about you and we want to protect you, but we also want you to protect your family. We also want you to alleviate pressure 
on the health systems because if you get infected and you need clinical care, you take up that bed as you deserve to take up that bed, but you take that bed from somebody else who may need it for another reason. So it's, it has a domino effect. And so this is why it's so critical that we really work to end this emergency this year. Thank you both. And speaking of prevention and protecting individuals, but also protecting populations, and as Abdi uh, explained that COVID is systemic disease, mm -hmm. way more complex uh, than we think in, on uh, as individuals. So last week we had some uh, social media posts published that Omicron is not a common cold. Um, so our viewers are asking uh, if it's not a cold, why do we have countries saying that they are going to treat COVID like a cold? And from middle of February, they are going to release all restrictions, including wearing masks. So it's a complicated question. Um, I think it was the Wordle. Uh, yes, yes I, I am probably the only person on the planet that doesn't know what that is. But um, I apologize to my family. They keep sending me these things. I'm just, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. but I think, you know, to say that um, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. And the common cold viruses are coronaviruses. So there are people that are out there that think that this virus may become more like the common cold in years from now. And that may, that may very well be true, but we're not in that situation yet. SARS-CoV-2, Omicron, the latest variant of concern, is not the common cold. It still causes severe disease in many individuals. And with the huge number of cases that we've seen, we still see a, a too large of a proportion of people needing hospitalization and dying from this. So it is not the common cold. Um, I forgot the second part of your question. So we are seeing some countries lift, lift, lift measures. restrictions, yes. So I think countries are taking decisions based on the situation that they're in and, and countries are in very different situations. They are looking at the population level immunity that they have um, from infection and from vaccination. They're looking at the capacities that they have to respond, to detect, to lift, to impose measures, to lift measures. They are looking at adjustment. Um, and they're looking at different ways in which they can apply tools. We are recommending that countries be cautious and to continue to use measures. I am not meaning lockdown where you shut down society, where you lock people away. That is not what we are talking about. But to use tools to continue to drive transmission down. Um, countries have to take those decisions. We issue guidance, but the policies that countries take are up to the countries themselves. We are working with them to ensure that they protect the people, uh, you know, their own people. But again, COVID-19 is a global problem. It's a pandemic and it needs a global solution. So what we look at is on, a, on the whole, what tools need to be applied. And we're working with countries how they best implement them. But we are asking countries to continue to be cautious and individuals to, to continue to be cautious as we go forward. Again, it will not be forever. You'll not need to wear a mask forever. We will not need to physically distance forever. But for now, it's really important that we, we be careful. Please, Abdi. Oh, sorry, Abdi. Thanks. I just wanted to add that uh, so that the viewers can add why some countries can, can take those measures. There's a competition between our immune system and the virus. And unfortunately, the virus, the way it's mutating, may they say RNA virus, it's, it has a good RNA to enzymes that proofread them. Unfortunately, Omicron has shown that this, whatever our wishful thinking, it always. So humility is required when dealing, predicting the future because nobody knows what is going to happen and the next variant is going to happen. Yes, we want to build our protective, build the population immunity to a certain level that even the next variant will not land and not cause damage. So it's the key unlock, as just alluded early on. The, the variant will come and unlock and get a smarter key you have that and then design the lock again and then lock. But if you put fire extinguishers, and that's what a lot of the countries are doing, they have built every floor of their house and the community they have fire extinguishers. Once the variant come and start, they will be able to switch. But unfortunately, it's a copycat because certain countries have done, when you don't have any fire extinguisher, you don't have health system, you don't have anything, because of the pressure you're seeing, you wanna take that. So what we are calling that is still at individual level, Country can decide well you by the end of the day it's your individual risk that's gonna matter. Population and policy letter they will be balancing public health, social economic, all that into consideration. So you continue as individual level 
with your measures so that you protect your loved one with getting the necessary vaccination because we really don't know what's going to happen. Oh, I wish we had, we knew what variant's going to come, but Omicron showed us that nature will always beat us. So we just need to build that defense. Thank you, Abdi. Maybe you can take this question from Arcella Kraitskova. How and uh, how to treat Omicron? Just stay at home, take paracetamol, and wait if it gets worse or better. <laughs> uh, for WHO, we, we issued several guidance. We have our clinical management and we also home care. But I will really encourage her to get contact with her because we have seen a lot of young people who are healthy quickly deteriorating. So being in touch with that, with your healthcare provider, it can be managed safely at, at home care level by a lot of the things we have in our guidance. But the first thing is to be in touch with with your healthcare provider and that who will guide you when you need referral. Because the assumption, because you're young and healthy, you can beat it. Omicron is a systemic disease that requires a close management by, by a physician. It's important what Abzi just said, because a lot of people ask us for individual level advice. And it's very difficult for us to sit here to give individual level advice because people are different. You know, the, they have their age, their underlying conditions, um, any, you know, past disease, whatever it may be. So as I just want to emphasize what Abdi has just said to speak to your physician, um, we issue, as he said, clinical guidance that works with uh, ministries of health and hospitals to outline what is the best course of clinical care based on what people have, if they're pregnant, if they're not, if they have underlying conditions. So for us to sit here, I, I get a lot of text messages from friends and family that says, I have a family member or a cousin that's having this. Always my advice is to speak to your doctor um, because we don't know the full situation. So I just wanted to highlight that we we cannot give individual level advice in a, in a setting like this, but please do talk to your doctor because every situation is different. Thank you both. And, uh, we're coming slowly to an end, and I have maybe a question or two before we close. And we received actually several questions today about Omicron and children. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the trends? What do we know? And then there were a question in particular, as you touched upon long COVID, what do we know about long COVID in children? Is it possible, and how often does it happen? In general. In long children. COVID in children. In children. So with, with regards to what we are learning about Omicron, again, we're still learning every day something new about this. We know um, that children can be infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus, whatever variant is circulating, and this is certainly also the case of, of Omicron as well. Um, what we tend to see when we see a new variant of concern circulating, we tend to see trends in different groups based on social mixing patterns. Uh, we saw this with alpha, we saw it with beta, we saw it with gamma, we saw it with delta, and we are seeing it with omicron. So the groups that are out and mixing um, will have higher rates of infection just for the sheer fact that they're, they're in contact with each other. We do see this among school-aged children because children are back at school. Um, children overall, and including with omicron, tend to have more uh, less severe disease compared to adults. That's certainly the case. More often they have asymptomatic infection, meaning that they don't have any symptoms at all. Those trends still continue. Um, but we do see children requiring hospitalizations. Um, and there have been some instances where we've seen hospitalizations increase in pediatric populations, you know, under, under five. Um, but we do, as we've seen Omicron circulate, we are also seeing other respiratory pathogens circulate. So it complicates the picture. We see RSV that is circulating, which is, tends to be a respiratory virus that infects young children or younger children. And influenza is back. So through our GISRIS, through our global influenza surveillance and response system, we are tracking influenza as we have been for decades. And in 2020, 2021, influenza circulation was, was minimal, if not wiped out but we are now starting to see increasing trends again. So this will complicate pictures. And speaking as a mom of two, of two young boys who always seem to have something, uh, you know, with a runny nose or, you know, something, not COVID-19 because we, we have access to tests here. We're very fortunate to that. Maybe not RSV, maybe something else. So it does complicate the picture in terms of what is circulating. So I mentioned that particularly because of kids, um, because kids tend to mix. And it's very difficult for children to you know, wear masks and keep them on, although we are seeing that they can, I'm not saying that they can't, to keep their physical distance, you know, is, is also quite challenging. 
Um, but we've seen many, many schools around the world, and I, I do want to emphasize how important it is for children to be in school, for their education, for their safety, for their well-being. And many you know, around the world have shown how they can keep schools, can open schools and keep schools open by taking measures of having good surveillance in schools, having good environmental controls of disinfection, of improving ventilation, wearing masks, making sure that the staff are vaccinated, and as well, keeping transmission down in the communities. So there's a lot that we are learning. On long COVID, we do know that um, you know children can, can get long COVID. Again, we don't have a good estimate of, of what proportion um, of children will have these longer term effects. We know that it is possible. That's not to scare parents out there. Um, but again, it's just to re-emphasize that we need to do what we can to, to reduce the spread. Abdi? Well, Maria, you covered very well, and that's in some countries vaccination is recommended. So if it's recommended, please get vac vaccine because the complication of COVID from all the, it is far much outweighed by that uh, vaccine that you get. So vaccines in those countries that's recommended, please, please vaccinate children. Children do get COVID. Unfortunately, sadly, some of them tragically have died. So the death of one child, it's, it's sad for everybody, for the whole community. So with those countries recommended, these are safe and effective. They have been studied and children have been receiving all the routine immunization. So it's a safe, please get vaccinated to protect your loved ones, however young they are, they can get. And the lottery of how the body immune system is gonna react, nobody can tell. We have seen almost 800 children, I think the US who died sadly. So children can get infected, they can get hospitalized, can get severe like any of us. Luckily, the vast majority of them don't get end up there. But that 0 0.1 in a big population is a big number. So please, please vaccinate your children with those countries recommended. For us, we have a criteria as WHO, 194 countries. We want to vaccinate the 3.1 billion people, the adults who are the highest risk, the healthcare workers. But in some countries, the world is not the same situation. So if you're in a country where vaccination for children is offered, please vaccinate your kids. Thank you both for very uh, insightful answers today and uh, to all our viewers for their great questions. Um, I'll summarize maybe the last one. Uh, it kind of came from different people, so I'll put it in one. What's the way forward? Has Omicron reached its peak? And will we be freer, freer when the spring comes? Would you like to start with that one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, we can be freer if we build the population immunity and the solidarity. Uh, unfortunately, what we have seen again and again, that the community and brothers and everyone going this politicization or the nationalism has not helped that. If we, the I don't know, 10 billion, if that has been equally distributed and everyone, there was no match, this hostility against vaccine will have been a different. So, Virus will continue. We can't predict what the virus. Virus will continue doing what they do, but it's the human behavior that can change the trajectory. So I'm a firm believer. I'm objective. Recently, I saw a Japanese uh, proverb someone shared. What happens when you sit on a rock for three years? It eventually gets warm. So we need to sit tight. It will get better, but it's not the time to relax. We need to get ready and improve that. So. Yes, three years, that's what the Japanese said. Maybe I'm not caught in there, but we will get there and we'll come there and we'll talk about the days of Omicron and the days of Delta. The, the five movies we watched after one of the series, maybe, but the only way out is we need to have a high level of population immunity. And that's the only way I can see forward. Thank you, Abdi. Thank you for joining us today. It was really great to have you with us. And Maria, your thoughts? For the end, well, I, I think I think we certainly can be in a better place in the spring, the Northern Hemisphere spring. Um, but it is up to us. You know, we're looking at several different scenarios going forward, um, and one of the scenarios, um, not mutually exclusive, but what we expect to see is that this virus, the transmission, will significantly reduce. With the tools that we have, we can significantly reduce transmission. Um, and this virus is well on its way to becoming endemic at a global level. We're not there yet, uh, but it's well on its way. We expect to continue to see flare-ups in populations who are not well protected, whether they haven't had the vaccine, uh, they refuse the vaccine, 
um, and we will still see outbreaks of people who are not well protected. Um, we could uh, go forward and start to see seasonal patterns with SARS-CoV-2. It's a respiratory pathogen, so we eventually expect to see some kind of seasonal pattern similar to what we see with influenza. Um, but again, we're not there yet. The virus is taking opportunities to spread and to thrive, and we are providing it plenty of opportunities to do so. Um, but this may mean, you know, we will need some more vaccines in the future. And there are a lot of vaccines that are still in development and underway, and that research needs to continue. But the big wild card right now are the variants. And that is what makes us so uncertain about the future. Um, having said that, we have incredible hope. And you hear us always speak about this hope. We have to use the tools at hand, and we have them in hand. What we need to make sure is that we have the solidarity around the world to get the tools in the hands of everyone, not just in what we call the haves versus the have-nots. The diversion in which people around the world have access to tools and those who have not is getting bigger, and we need to close that gap, and that is up to us. So two sides of the equation, increase vaccination coverage among those who are most at risk in all countries, not just in some countries. Use the vaccines that we have effectively, appropriately, morally, ethically correct. Um, and that will have a massive impact as we go into this year, as we continue to go into this year, we can take the death and disease out of COVID-19. And by the spring, we could see a significant reduction in that tangible, saving people's lives now. But we also, on the other side of that equation, have to drive transmission down. If we don't, we will continue to see variants. And the next one could be more severe. There's no guarantee that variants that will continue to emerge will be less severe. They may, but we can't really sit back and just wait for that to happen. It is up to us. It continues to be up to us. So we are cautious. We are hopeful. Um, we are nervous, but it's up to what we do. And every single person out there has a role to play. I'm a broken record on this, and I will continue to be because what we also want people to feel is empowered to be empowered to do something about your life and the life of your loved ones. Get vaccinated when it's your turn. Continue to adhere to measures to reduce your exposure. Um, and we do need governments to have policies that make sense in their countries. And we are there to support governments in implementing those and adjusting those as we enter this third year of the pandemic. Thank you so much, Maria. It was really a great pleasure to have you both today. And I really thank to all our viewers for great questions. I think um, it was a great variety. Um, and for watching us from Kenya, Cameroon, DRC, Chile, Iran, India, Nigeria, South Africa, Luxembourg, Zambia, Poland, Canada, US, Turkey, and many others, uh, please stay safe, be, feel empowered. There's a lot that each of us can do. Um, and until next week, please follow us on our social media channels or website for any further updates on COVID and its variants of concern, including Omicron and its sublineage BA.2. Goodbye. <laughs>